Well, thank you guys again for being here. Um, <clears throat> I don't know if you guys know this, but it is the last week of the Christmas season. Do we have any tears yet? I'm sorry, guys. This, is, this thing is wild. I might need to get a different mic. It's finicky. You spend money on things and they break. It's sad, isn't it? It's a horrible thing. If it keeps doing that, we'll switch mics. But it's the last week of the Christmas season. Has anybody, like I found myself, it's a little embarrassing to admit, sitting in my living room thinking about that the other day, like we've got like eight days left. What are we going to do? You know, it's like, and then I'm, it's going to be the 26th and I'm like, hey, 364, we can do this. You know, we can get there again. But we are in the last week, and I'll be honest with you, uh, as I was getting ready for this Sunday, I originally had something else that I was like, oh, I'm going to jump into this for the Christmas series thing. It'd be good. I was going to focus a little more on just like, just simply generosity and that, which is a fantastic thing. Uh, But I felt like God was leading my heart in a different direction. And he's leading my heart in the direction of what we're going to talk through today. Uh, And this was just about this last week of Christmas. So I don't know about you guys, but uh, throughout this Christmas season so far, uh, for me personally, I feel like sometimes, and I've, I've, I've experienced this in the past, but this year too, I get caught up in all the Christmas stuff. Have you ever been caught up in all the Christmas stuff where you've got the lights and the trees and the gifts and I've got... 86 Christmases to attend, and we've got to do this, and, and we are serving, and it's good. We're plugged in. We're doing all this stuff, but there's so much stuff to do. Amen? There's so many things to do. There's so much stuff to buy, to get, to experience, all the traditions with the family, and those are all and can be really good things, right? But sometimes we get caught in the stuff, and if you get caught too much in the stuff, you oftentimes lose sight of what's most important. Have you ever done that? You lose sight of what we're really supposed to be focused on and digging into and maybe what God is trying to do in this season for us. And so that's what I want to dig into today. It may feel a little on the nose, but I do believe that there's a couple good things here, some big things that are so important for us and that can change this last week of Christmas and maybe even how we look at Christmas every single year, some different steps that we can take when we step into the Christmas season every year so that we're on track with what God has for us. But let's be real real quick. Think about the Christmas season and all the things that are pulling our attention, pulling our time, telling us what gets us to a full Christmas. I think most people's mentality when you come into Christmas, if you're like me, you come in and you're like, I want to have the best Christmas ever every single year, right? Like, I want to do all the things. I want to do the, 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 the lights in the park. I want to hang the lights on the house. I want to decorate the tree, have the music, drink the hot chocolate, build gingerbread houses, do all the things. It's, it's kind of pushed on us too, isn't it? Like every Christmas movie in the world has a way that you can experience Christmas to the fullest. Like think about that for a second. Anybody here a fan of the movie Elf? Come on, let's go. Some of you guys got the outfit at home. I can already tell. The best way to spread Christmas cheer is? Come on, Louis, that's it, guys. Let's go home. We got it. No, that's exactly it, right? That's what they're pushing. Hey, you want to have that Christmas cheer? You want to live Christmas up? You want to experience it to the fullest and really get the value of Christmas? You got to have that cheer. You got to get out there and sing it loud and proud and share it, sing the songs, play the music, all the things. Christmas vacation fans, I won't judge you. Uh, It's in here, right? If you're a Clark Griswold, right? And I'm, I'm kind of this way too. You're like, hey, Clark's showing us we got to keep, we got to get after it, right? The goal is to strive to make Christmas happen. The house needs to be an explosive light display. Everything needs to be perfect. The, the turkey needs to be cooked just right. I need to have all my family with us. That's how you get the perfect Christmas. And if things don't go right, you keep struggling until they do go right, right? Make it happen. Maybe even do some crazy stuff for a Christmas bonus here or there. You make it happen. You do what you got to do. What about Jingle All the Way? This is one, I don't, I don't know if this is known by a lot, but I used to love this one. You know what I'm saying? Basically, this one's telling you, be the parent who does everything they can. Maybe even break the law to make sure your kid gets the gift that they want for Christmas. If you do that, Christmas will be great, right? <laughs> and then Home Alone, just don't forget your kids and everything will be great. <laughs> Christmas will be perfect if you have a good head count. You know what I mean? Like everything's fine. But seriously, don't, don't all these movies, all these other things out there in the world, when it comes to the Christmas season, they're like, hey, do you want the great Christmas? Do X, Y, and Z. Here's how you obtain that. Here's how you look back at the end of the season and go, we did it. I feel fulfilled. I feel cheerful. I feel that joy, that peace, all those things. But can we, as a church today, be honest? Or any of those things that we just talked about from those movies or any of the things that I might have listed off earlier, are those the difference makers when it comes to the Christmas season? Are they 
would at the end of the Christmas season leave us feeling that peace, that cheer, that joy, that fulfilled feeling. Like this year, it was right. I don't know about you guys, but I've had many years where I've tried all those things and even checked every box and still left feeling like I missed something important, like I missed something more. Don't get me wrong. I know Jesus is the reason for the season, but did I miss what God might have been trying to do in the midst of all the other things that I was doing myself? That's what we're going to get into today. Are those things the difference maker? Short answer, no, right? Long answer, last Christmas, I had this amazing experience where I got to have all of my siblings together. The four of us were together for the first Christmas in years, y'all. It was beautiful, and I'm thankful to God for it. We had a great time. Was it a perfect time? No, (laughs) because family is family, amen? And my siblings are watching this like, you didn't have a good time? I had a great time. (laughs) But things didn't go perfectly. Like, I'll be honest with you. At the, end of the Christ, at the end of that season with my family and, and them all being together, I did have some disappointment. Not because I don't like my siblings, not because I was just ready for them to be out of my house, nothing like that, but because we're human beings. And when we put our hopes into the wrong things and we expect people to satisfy what we need, we expect all the traditions and all the things to satisfy and fill the void, we will be left with disappointment. We will be left feeling unsatisfied. The same is true for this Christmas season. There is more here that I think even as followers of Jesus, we oftentimes let slip over our minds and our heads, that we forget and that we're left feeling. And because we forget, we're left feeling like something was missing this Christmas. Something was supposed to be different. So what is it then? What makes the difference? I want to jump into two things today. Take a look at two different moments in the story of Christmas, in the story of Jesus's birth, a little beforehand and in it that I think can help us, that can help us to to, to get back on track maybe, or help remind us of what it takes for us to get into the place where we really are leaning into what God has for us for Christmas. No longer stuck in our own things, no longer fighting to make it perfect our own way, but inviting God in and asking for his help with it. So two things. Uh, The first one is going to come actually before the birth of Jesus. And just so you know, we're going to be walking through the book of Luke a lot, Luke 1 and 2. So if you've got your Bibles on your phones, or you have your actual Bible, you can pull those out. If you don't have it, we're going to have the verses on the screen. screens. You can follow us along. But uh, the first one is in Luke 1, and I want to give you uh, just a little bit of background on this. So we're going to talk about a guy named Zachariah. Everybody say Zachariah. So Zach and his wife, Elizabeth, and we're talking about them because they played this important role in this whole Christmas story early on, Uh, something beneficial that I think for us happened with them. So Zachariah was a Jewish priest, okay? And him and his wife, Elizabeth, uh, were seen as like amazing in the eyes of God. They they were doing right things. They were seen as righteous to God. Um, They were great. One of the things that you need to know about Zach and Elizabeth is they didn't have any kids. In fact, Elizabeth was unable to have children, uh, and the scripture says, and so we, her and Zach were getting older and didn't have any kids. Um, So they were struggling and dealing with that and having to live life with that in place um, until one day, uh, Zach is uh, at the temple and he is doing his stuff, and an angel appears to him, right? Don't you love those moments? Like, and I love in Scripture, it's like, an angel appeared, and they were terrified. Of course they were. You know what I mean? It's like, can you imagine just like just working, just writing, taking a note, and it's like, oh, like, dude, are you? I would have swung on Gabriel, you know what I mean? No, but it, it gets crazy. Like, what's going on out here? And this is what happens. He's there. He's doing his thing. The angel Gabriel shows up, and it's like, don't be afraid. Yeah, right, right? And he's ter- said, Scripture says he's terrified. But what happens is Gabriel tells Zach something that's going to change his and Elizabeth's life forever. He says, hey, your wife, even though she's old, even though you guys don't have any yet, she's about to have a kid. Your wife is going to be pregnant. So you're Zach again. You're like, first off, still shook from everything that just happened. But... Gabriel, don't you know that I'm old? (laughs) She's old. That we've tried this and it just hasn't happened. Like, it's not, like, thanks for maybe trying to encourage me, but I don't think you see what we've been through. I don't think you know that it hasn't worked up until now. So what's going to be different about this, right? Just some of that doubt. Have you ever been there? Maybe get some hope, some good news, and and it's it's hard for us, right? It's hard to not let the doubt kind of just seep out. 
and to, to, to have questions and worry and stress and be like, well, no, and kind of close the door on anything hopeful right away. It's natural. It's normal. We, we do that. And you see that happen here with Zach. He's like, I don't, I don't think so. And he's questioning and questioning, how? We're old. How? How's that going to happen? And so Gabriel, I think he just, you know, kind of had it up to here and was like, all right, man, look, like, I just, I just, I'm an angel. Like, I just appeared to you. Why don't you chill out? And matter of fact, you're not allowed to talk, okay? So literally, he's like, you know what? I'm going to take your voice away. And it's literally what he does. He gets, like, reverse silent treatments, Zachariah, and he takes his voice away. And he says, hey, because you're struggling to believe that this is what's going to happen, I was sent by the one and only Yahweh, by God himself, to tell you this. And because you're struggling to believe that, I'm just going to take your voice away. I don't know what, you know, I'm going to take it away until the day that your son is born. That's right. It's a son. And when you have the son, you're going to name him John. That's his name. Make sure you do that. When he's born, you can have your voice back. So that all concludes. Zach goes back to Elizabeth, back home. And when he gets there later on, they find out, sure enough, she's pregnant. Praise God. Amen. Just like the angel had said, she is pregnant. Well, time goes on. And not long after, uh, a little while into Elizabeth's pregnancy, uh, Mary the mother of Jesus, she shows up because she's a relative of Elizabeth. And Mary was told by the angel Gabriel as well that uh, Elizabeth, her relative, was pregnant and that Mary should go see her and all this stuff. So Mary goes to see her because Mary's now pregnant. She's found out she's pregnant with Jesus. All this stuff has happened. They get together. They celebrate because they see that God is working in a lot of crazy ways in their family right now, that God is performing miracles in the midst right now. And so they get together and celebrate that and give praise to God. A little while after that, it's time for John to be born. And John is born, and he's a healthy baby. And right after he's born, all these people in the town, and they're, they're around Elizabeth. And Scripture says somewhere around eight days later, they finally, which is kind of crazy, eight days later, they're like, hey, we should probably name him. <laughs> you know what I mean? We should probably give him a name. What do you, what do you guys think? And they're like, you know, do we, do we name him after his father? What do we do? You know what I mean? Like, and Elizabeth's like, oh, let's name him John, right? That's, we got to name him John. And people are like, why? Nobody in your family's name is John. It's one syllable. You know what I mean? Like, what are you, it's something, come on, get creative now. I love the name John, no disrespect. <laughs> name him John. Well, let's ask his dad. What does his dad think? So Zachariah comes in again, he cannot speak. So he grabs a tablet to write on and he, he writes on this thing. He goes, his name is John. And he shows them his name is John. Scripture says, immediately, Zachariah got his voice back immediately after showing that and saying, showing them his name is John, he could speak again. And here's where we're picking up in scripture. Scripture says that he immediately started praising God. Luke 1, 67 through 75. This is a big, big chunk of scripture, so stick with me. It says, then his father, John's father, Zechariah, was filled with the Holy Spirit and gave this prophecy. And again, this is, this is John the Baptist we're talking about, okay? This guy was going to get it right. He was going to make a way. He was going to lead the way for the coming of the Savior, right? He was filled with the Holy Spirit and gave this prophecy. Praise the Lord, the God of Israel, because he has visited and redeemed his people. Off the bat, again, Zach gets his voice back and he goes, praise God right? He has sent us a mighty savior from the royal line of his servant David, just as he promised through his holy prophets long ago. Now we will be saved from our enemies and from all who hate us. He has been merciful to our ancestors by remembering his sacred covenant, the covenant he swore with an oath to our ancestor Abraham. We've been rescued from our enemies so that we can serve God without fear in holiness and righteousness for as long as we live. Do you see this? No voice tells him his name is John. That's what the angel told me that God said we needed to name him. So that's what's going to happen. His obedience comes in. The blessing comes in from the father. He gets his voice back and immediately, I mean, this man just had a son. He got his voice back. He's got a lot to celebrate. And so he begins by praising God. But when he starts by praising God, he doesn't go, God, thank you for giving me my voice back. God, thank you for my son, John. I mean, he's, it, that's in there later on. But the first thing he does is he praises God for Jesus. Do you see this? This prophecy of a Savior. He goes, hey, God, you're so good. Not because of all that you're doing for me, but for you're doing for all of us. You've brought a Savior. The King of Kings has arrived and that is the most important thing that I could ever use my voice for, Lord. 
I want to celebrate the, the, the bringing of Jesus to this earth. So he does that. He responds with that, the prophecy of a mighty Savior that would rescue his people. So if you don't know this, part of this reason or the big reason that this happens, why, why he responds this way is because all of these people were waiting. God's people, the Jewish people, God's Israel, they were waiting for this. There was a prophecy in Isaiah. Here's what it says, Isaiah 9, 6 through 7. For a child is born to us, a son is given to us. We know this. The government will rest on his shoulders and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. His government and its peace will never end. He will rule with fairness and justice from the throne of his ancestor David for all eternity. The passionate commitment of the Lord of heaven's armies will make this happen. They just saw that happen. The passionate commitment of the Lord of heaven's armies, their heavenly father, they saw his commitment come into fruition. They saw his promise take place. They look back at the prophecies given, this, this, this Israel, this people, God's people waiting because they were in brokenness. They were striving and fighting and, and working towards and sacrificing, doing all these things to be in right standing with God. And I think what, we're coming to, what they were coming to the realization of and really what God had known all along, of course, was that this way of life, this way of being right with God, just per, trying to get the law down perfect and the sacrifices, and it wouldn't work in the end. Something else needed to happen. An ultimate sacrifice needed to be made. Somebody needed to come and save them. And so when Jesus arrives and, and, and Zechariah knows this news, and then he sees God working in the midst of all these other places, sees these miracles happening from God, he knows the promise of God is fulfilled. That one day, the Savior who is now here as a baby, he will go on and he will be hung on a cross and he will say, it is finished. And right now, it's starting. He's here to save the world, to change it forever. So what is it that Zechariah has realized? What does all these people have realized? They've realized and remembered their need for the Savior. They've realized and remembered their need for Christmas. That's true for us. We've got one more week, and it's not too late for us to start remembering right now our need for for Christmas. Again, we get so caught up in all the other things, the stuff going on, and some of these things are really good things. I'm not saying you can't do these traditions and have fun, but are those things getting in the way of our ability to sit and remember that we are sinners in need of a Savior, and that Christmas time is the beginning of all of that happening for us? It's the beginning of the greatest gift we will ever receive. God himself came down as an infant baby in the most vulnerable state and lived this life for us to one day die so that we can spend eternity with him. It's so easy around Easter to really dig into this, right? And be like, oh, thank you, God, for the victory. Thank you for that. The victory started right here. How often do we dwell on that in Christmas? How often are we sitting like Zachariah going, I just got my voice back and I'm gonna do nothing but praise God. This Christmas season, I could have none of the other stuff, but if I can remember the sacrifice that was made for me, the baby that came down as a king for me, that's enough. I can have the most joyful, peaceful, cheerful Christmas in the entire world simply because of that. We need to remember our need for Christmas because it makes all of the difference. Uh, yesterday, Rachel and I, my wife, we were, she was sharing a devotional with me that she had found because she knew what I was kind of jumping into today. And here's what it said in, in this devotional. It said, every year, we as Christians like to remind everyone that Jesus is the reason for the season, right? But how often do we truly sit and reflect on why he is? It's easy to walk around and go, don't forget. I see you. You like that present? Jesus. You know what I mean? But how often do we sit and go, oh yeah, he did all that for me. He's the reason because he came down for me. He saved the world. He saved me. It should blow our minds, right? We know this, but we get so caught up. And Jesus is like, I'm right here. I sure am the reason, and I love you. So spend time with me. Bring me into this. The other stuff's great, but don't let it get in the way. Remember the need for Christmas. Here's how I, here's how I see it, okay? 
Anybody in here an uh, Avengers fan, like uh, Marvel, anybody? Come on, don't be shy. It's all right. We can nerd out. It's good stuff, right? I love Marvel, love the Avengers. Uh, well, there's a scene in uh, Marvel, uh, in uh, the Avengers Infinity War, the movie, okay? And uh, the Avengers are fighting all these, like, monsters and bad guys and all kinds of stuff, and truthfully, they're losing. Like, you got Black Panther out here, you got Black Widow, you got uh, Hulks out here, and, like, all these people, and there's they're, all these guys who are superheroes, these girls who are superheroes, and they're getting beat up by these bad guys. There's too many of them. And in the, in the movie, in the scene, they start to get overwhelmed, and they're about to lose this fight, and all of a sudden, this beam of light just comes straight down to the ground, and sure enough, the strongest Avenger, Thor himself, pops out, right? He's got the lightning and his axe, and he's like, you know, he just all, it looks tough, you know, and you see Hulk, he pops out of the Hulk Buster suit because he's not able to transform or whatever. I know I'm getting into the details, but he pops out and he goes, oh, you guys are screwed now. You know what I mean? Because Thor's there and he's like, this is it. You guys are in trouble because the difference maker just arrived. Can we feel that way about Christmas? The difference maker just arrived. He's a baby. You don't understand <laughs> That baby's going to save the world. The difference maker has just arrived. And then Thor goes on and screams, bring me Thanos. And you're just hype and, you know, he goes crazy. That's, what, that's Jesus going after death in the grave. You know what I mean? Sin, he's like going to defeat it. The difference maker is here. We should go crazy in Christmas because the difference maker has arrived. Amen? That's point number one again. We need to remember the need for Christmas. Point number two comes the second. We're going to take a look at a second moment, and it comes right after the birth of Jesus, okay? Right around that time. This is Luke 2, and we're going to read through this because one, for Christmas sake, and then two, because there is some stuff we're going to pull out of it. Uh, but Luke 2, 8 through 14, this is the shepherds watching over their flocks at night. Here we go, verse 8. That night, there were shepherds. The night that Jesus was born, there were shepherds staying in the fields nearby, guarding their flocks of sheep. Suddenly, an angel of the Lord appeared among them, and the radiance of the Lord's glory surrounded them. They were terrified. Again, <laughs> you would think that they'd be like, hey, we're, you know, hey, <laughs> just gently. It's like, oh, real, real scary. But the angel reassured them, do not be afraid. Super helpful. I bring you good news that will bring great joy to all people. The Savior, yes, the Messiah, the Lord, has been born today in Bethlehem, the city of David. And you, are, you will recognize him by this sign, okay? You will know that he is the savior of the world by this right here. You will find a baby wrapped snugly in strips of cloth lying in a manger. Suddenly, the angel was joined by a vast host of others, the armies of heaven, praising God and saying, glory to God in highest heaven and peace on earth to those whom God is pleased. Amen? So when you first read this, there's questions, right? Like the biggest one that I can think of is why the shepherds? Why is it that God chose these guys who, let's be real, shepherds were seen as low, right? Like society-wise, these guys were not your guys that you went to for like authority and counsel and all this stuff. Like they probably didn't smell too great and they hung out with creatures that didn't smell too great all day long, right? It's like people did not respect, they didn't put respect on the name of the shepherds, okay? But you have the God of the universe sends these angels to these guys in their fields, and he's like, hey, we're going to let you guys be the first ones to know the Savior was just born. So we don't know all the details as to why, right? Maybe God is just trying to remind us that the gospel of Jesus Christ is for every person, that it does not matter what the world says or looks at, but this is for everybody. But I believe he had some other things that he was trying to do with the shepherds as well. So they made the choice after hearing from the angels, hey, Jesus is born. Here's how you'll see him. You should go see him. This is how you'll know who he, that he is the Savior. He's going to be here, strips of cloth, snugly, right, in a manger. So they decided to go. Maybe a little scared still, but they went with urgency, right? It says they hurried off to see, the, to see Jesus. So they arrived and found Jesus lying in a manger, just like the angels said after they went. And Luke 2, 17 through 20 says this. After seeing him, the shepherds told everyone what had happened and what the angel had said to them about this child. All who heard the shepherd's story were astonished, but Mary kept all these things in her heart and thought about them often. The shepherds went back to their flocks, glorifying and praising God for all they had heard and seen. It was just as the angels had told them. So what's the point here? 
What's the significance of these shepherds and them going to see Jesus? What, what's, what's the difference that's made here in the Christmas story? You see, the shepherds made a choice. And the choice that they made was to follow God's leading. They chose to follow the direction, the leading that God had come and that he had sent the angels to tell them and say, hey, I'm doing something here. Come check it out. Come be a part of it. And why does this matter? Why does it matter that they went to see Jesus? Why does it matter that they decided to follow God's leading? Because they chose to follow God's leading, three different things that are important, okay, from this. One, they received confirmation for themselves. Confirmation that what the angels were saying, what God had called them to go do, was absolutely true. That this was the Savior of the world. Again, the angel said, here's how you'll know that this is the Messiah. You'll find a baby in a manger. Can I just about promise you that there was not going to be another baby in a manger around them at all, right? Like, and especially one that is considered to be the king of kings. That's what, you're, that's what the angels say. Like, hey, the Messiah, the savior of the world, right? You're like, dang, that guy's powerful then. They're like, no, it's a baby and he's in a manger. It doesn't make sense, but that's where you're going to find him. There's no way you can miss him. And that's exactly what happened. They found the baby wrapped in strips of cloth, snugly in the manger. They were able to see that everything that God had called them to follow and do through the angels was true. They received that confirmation, that connection with the Lord, and that he truly was working and moving. The second thing, because they chose to follow God's leading, they were able to spread the good news. It says that after they had seen Jesus, they went about telling everybody about what they just experienced, and the people were amazed. They were astonished. They were able to go and spread the news, let more people know, right, that the prophecy that was given so long ago from Isaiah all the way to here in the Old Testament to now, what we've been waiting urgently for, folks, it's here. Jesus is here to spread the hope, to spread the good news, to let people know, hey, you can stop trying to figure this out yourself. The Savior's here. The difference maker has arrived again. They got to spread the good news of Jesus's birth to so many others. God used them because of their obedience to step into what he was doing to follow his leading to make a difference for those around them. And the third thing, confirmation for themselves, spread the good news, and confirmation for Miss Mary, right? Mary, can you imagine this whole journey she's been on? Teenager says, hey, you're going to have a baby. She's like, I'm not married. I'm, I'm just a teenager. This isn't right. It's like, yeah, well, It's going to be the Holy Spirit. You're going to have the Son of God. It's like, I don't understand. (laughs) A lot of questions, price, a lot of doubt, right? A lot of hardship that they went through. And then not only that, but as they go on, this journey does not go as expected. Have you ever ridden a donkey? It's probably not great. You know what I'm saying? Like to travel that far. And then you get to the place where you're told you need to go. And there's, everybody's like, there's no room for you. It's like, are we really in God's will? Is this really, are we doing the right thing? Is this his plan for sure? You just told me that the king of kings is going to be born to me. And you're telling me he's going to be born with animals in a barn. This, this can't be right. You know what I'm saying? At least that's how my, I'm like, God, are you really, is this real? And then the shepherds show up. And they're like, no, 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 this seems crazy. It doesn't seem like the right place for the king of kings to be born, but it's exactly where God planned it to happen. Mary received confirmation from the arrival of the shepherds that God was with her every single step of the way. And it was all happening the way that he wanted to, that he planned for it to happen. The shepherds were able to share that, and Mary was able to hold on to those things, bring bring them close to her heart, and realize God is with me. God is moving. God is performing miracles. He's making a difference He's saving and changing the world right now. So you take all that together, and here's here's what this ultimately means for us. Just like the shepherds and just like Mary, it's important in the Christmas season that we remember and seek and follow. We remember to seek and follow God's leading. We have to step into what he is doing around us, for us, with us, with those around us. We've got to look for that and jump into it. Later on, Jesus would tell some Pharisees the importance of doing just this. John 5, 19 through 20, Jesus explained. This is, he's talking to some Pharisees who are getting on to him about performing things, doing things, working on the Sabbath and doing other things, healing a man. In verse 19, Jesus explained, I tell you the truth, 
The son can do nothing by himself. He does only what he sees the father doing. Whatever the father does, the son also does. For the father loves the son and shows him everything he is doing. In fact, the father will show him how to do even greater works than healing this man. Then you will truly be astonished. God is constantly moving. He's constantly working and going. And at the same time, just like he does for Jesus, just like Jesus has the example of, God calls us into what he is doing. God wants to use us to do this work. He wants to use us to change the world around us. He wants to use us to love the people around us, to make a difference in the world around us, to spread the gospel, to spread the good news of Jesus, to make sure other people, just like we're called to do, know and take the time to remember their need for Christmas, remember their need for a savior and enter into a relationship with him. The Father is moving, and it's our job to jump in, to follow the leading that God has placed before us. God will help us when we do that, right? He will show us what we need. He will give us what we need to move forward in what we're doing. He's constantly moving. We are called to be used by Him. And this applies for everything, of course, right? Not just Christmas time, but just our lives in general. But isn't the Christmas season an amazing season to do this? To say, God, what are you doing right now? How are you moving, God? Help me to not just make this all about me, God, but what are you doing around me? Or God, maybe you've got something for me. Maybe it has nothing to do with Christmas traditions, but my heart needs some restoration. Is that where you need to move, God? Help me to jump into that. Help me to submit to that and to trust your will and your way. Back when uh, Mary went to visit Elizabeth, right, her relative, and they both found out they were pregnant and all that stuff happened and it was great, uh, something really cool happened when uh, Mary arrived. Here's what it says in Luke 1, 42 through 45. Elizabeth gave a glad cry and exclaimed to Mary, God has blessed you above all women and your child is blessed. Why am I so honored that the mother of my Lord, of my Savior, should visit me? When I heard your greeting, the baby in my womb jumped for joy. Verse 45, you are blessed because you believed that the Lord would do what he said. Do you see that? You are blessed because you believed that the Lord would do what he said. God told you he was going to bring a savior into the world and he was going to use you to do that. You followed the leading of God. You trusted that God was who he said he was and that he was going to do what he said he was going to do. And now the blessing comes. Now we see God pour out. Now we see God bring about miracles and things that only he can do. This is where the life change happens. When we jump in and we trust God's plan, when we jump in and follow his leading, that's where life change happens. This is where the difference is made and where God gets to show up and show out like he always does when he says he's going to do it and do what only, he, what only he can do. When we follow God's leading, this is where the miracles happen. Do you see that, church? But it takes trust. It takes saying, hey, your way is better than mine, God. In the Christmas season, I might, I might think I'm getting all the things down, doing all the Christmas things right, but is it what you're leading me towards? Because that's where the blessing lies. So what now? Last thing before we close out. Just one thing, one step that we can take. Because this is a lot to take in and figure out and jump in. We got one more week of Christmas, but it's not too late to start stepping into the place that God has called us to be in this season, to not miss out on what he might be trying to do and to be in right standing with him as we walk this out. So what now? My challenge to all of us, and this is gonna sound weird at first, is build a Christmas budget. You're like, I already did that. It didn't work. It's done. I know that. But I'm not just talking about money. I'm not talking about finances. I'm talking about your time. I'm talking about your schedule. I'm talking about your heart. It's time to budget out and figure out what's going to actually fit to make Christmas what God has called it to be this year. Because how many times do we overdo it when it comes to budgets? How many times do we bite off more than we can chew, try to fit in more than we can handle, and we become overextended, right? We're left with overextended bank accounts and schedules, but empty hearts. We do it all the time. So what we need to do this year and every year after this is we need to create this budget, but we don't need to do it ourselves. It's time to go get that advisor. 
time to invite the, invi- the advisor in and say, hey, how do I do this your way? How do I do this with health? How do I do this in a way where I don't forget that I need Christmas? How do I do this in a way where I'm following your leading God and not my own? Where I'm doing what you've called me to and not just what I might want to do. Help me make this work, God. Help me make this budget work so that I can experience Christmas the way that you intended me to, that you've called me to. So I can experience real cheer and joy and peace that only comes from you. Advise me, help me, lead me. And the hard part of this is that means some of those traditions, they got to get checked and they got to get cut. Some of those things that we may love about this season, right? And again, this is coming from somebody who's all about those things. I love them. God may come in and say, hey, that thing you want to do, those lights you want to hang, that time you want to do, spend watching that movie or doing that or going to this thing and seeing those lights and all these Christmas traditions, they're actually causing you more chaos. They're actually causing you more struggle and stress. Let's not do those. Instead, let's replace it with this. Let's replace it with what I have for you the real cheer, the real change, the real difference is made when we invite God in and we let him decide how it's supposed to be. And that applies for for everything, but it applies to the Christmas season as well. You guys want to stand? We're going to pray. So again, all this, I'm not, I don't say all this for all of us to leave and become Grinches, right? No traditions, nothing like that. Those things are good, and I believe that God can use those in great ways in our families and in our hearts. But do we have the space in our heart to let him move? Or have we filled it with things that we think we need? We've got one week left. Can we give it to Jesus and let him make it great? Amen? Let's pray, church. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for the season we're in. God, it is beautiful. It is fun. Sometimes it's hard. Sometimes it's the exact opposite, Lord, for some of us. But no matter where we are, I'm thankful that you are with us and you are for us. And so, God, whatever we may need, Lord, I pray, I pray that we go to you. Lord, whatever we're trying to do for this Christmas, I pray that we surrender it at your feet and ask that you have your way in this season, God. Maybe some of us need healing in our hearts, God. We don't care about the traditions. We don't care about the things that others are doing, God, or what the world tries to tell us to. We just need you. So, Lord, help us to remember that we need this Christmas, God, and we just need to sit with you sometimes. We need to be healed by you. Give us what we need, Lord. Some of us need more time with our families, God. The traditions that we're trying to make happen, they're too chaotic. They're getting in the way. So maybe we need to cut them so that we can actually experience this time with family like you've called us to, like you want for us. Whatever it may be, Jesus, lead us. Help us to see that leading and to follow it, God. We surrender it to you. We thank you for this season. We worship your mighty name. Thank you for coming here. Thank you for saving us. Help us to remember the importance of that always. It's in your perfect name we pray. Amen.